Do you guys know what this is? Okay. You know why I'm so excited? Because this is the first time that this person has ever been to Canada. And I'm telling you, I love you people. You're amazing. I am from Atchison, Kansas. And if I would have bust and boated, I may have beat Ontario, but I did not bust and boat. I flew. That's amazing, by the way. 30 hours? Mm. Okay, give it up for yourself. That's fine. That's good. I love it. So I'm from, I'm from Kansas. How many of you, the minute I said that, thought of Dorothy, Toto, or a tornado? <laughs> okay, so good things come from Kansas. That's what I have to say, okay? When I'm not hanging out with cool people like you, I'm hanging out with these cool people. There they are. Okay, so this is Thomas. He is seven, and Fulton is six, and that's baby Kate. She's two. Do you want to see the rest of my family? Okay, you can do the next slide, too. So this is my family. This is my husband. Um, his name's Andy, but I call him Swath. So the title of my talk is Chosen, just like the title or the theme of this awesome weekend. And I started thinking about how in our world, in our everyday lives, it's all about being chosen. And nowhere do you see this better than reality TV. How many, you guys, isn't it amazing all the different shows? I mean, they have like singing, like all types of singing. Any voice fans in here? Any idol fans? Any, right? I mean, just like, uh, can you sing? And how, like all the different genres, right? Then you have dancing and all the, you know, like 10 different, every network has one, right? And then you get into like the history channel and like the cooking channel and they all have their little competitions and like being voted, being chosen, being picked. And it's like, I can make a better cupcake than you, watch me, right? I mean, you get, I can deep sea, deep sea fish better than you, watch me, right? And then call and vote 45 times, right? Or text. That's how it is. Everyone is just dying to be chosen. But I think the ultimate being chosen was something I witnessed the other day. A friend of mine showed me a YouTube clip. I'm sorry, ladies, are there any One Direction fans in the audience? Oh. So maybe a couple of gentlemen might like them too. So I saw the ultimate being chosen the other day. It was a video clip of a One Direction concert. And halfway through the concert, the guys chose a girl out of the audience to come on stage and be serenaded. And I seriously think, I mean, she was like jello. They had to like carry her up, right? And like lay her on the, on the stage. And she was just sitting there and she just had this look on her face like, if I die right now, it would just be okay. You know what I mean? And I just thought to myself, okay, the ultimate being chosen. I'm sorry, guys, your example might be LeBron James with courtside tickets standing at your door. I don't know, something like that. I remember when I was a kid, it's almost embarrassing to tell you guys this story, but I remember when I was little, I would have this dream that the doorbell would ring and my mom would open the door and it would be new kids on the block in their limo outside the door. And they'd be like, hey, we're here for Sarah and we wanna take her to the concert and she's gonna sing back up. And I'd be like, oh my gosh. Because every 18 year old rock pop star wants to hang out with an eight year old, right? Yeah, of course. Um, and I always thought, well, it probably didn't help that I had like the poster of their faces right here and the bedspread and you fall asleep every night and they're everywhere, right? But I wanted, I wanted them to choose me. I wanted to be chosen, right? And it's, it's in our nature to, to want to be picked. But the problem is, is that it seems like the world likes to set the standards for what it means to be chosen and who gets to be chosen, who makes the cut. I call it the world's idea of perfect. Women, it looks something like this. You have to be size negative two, flawless skin, perfect bangs, you know, 5'11", preferably. And if you can't figure it out on your own, Pinterest has at least 100,000 videos to help you out, right? And for the gentlemen, you know, the world's idea perfect for you. I always have in this Im image in my head of like this guy, like a rapper in a white suit with a grill and like shades and he's like standing on a car and there's like women all around and stacks of money and he's just like going like this, you know? <laughs> And, and everyone's like, I want to be you. And the guys are like, he has it all, right? That's kind of the world's idea of perfect. And so we think to ourselves, okay, I can't compete with an airbrush model, or I can't compete with a guy with millions of dollars and an awesome grill. But, you know, that's kind of bankrupt. But then what happens is, is 
we take that idea of perfect and we jump on Facebook and we start comparing ourselves to all of our friends. And then we walk down the hallway of our high school and we start comparing ourselves to each person standing by a locker. And that's where the real damage sets in. I was giving a talk in Iowa one time, and it was this awesome Catholic high school, about a thousand kids, and they asked me if I wanted to stay for lunch after the talk just to hang out. I was like, absolutely. So I grabbed my tray, and I was all excited. I went through the line and came into the lunchroom, and there it was, you know, the high school lunchroom, your guys' reality. And I walked in there, and I could smell the intimidation in that room. Competition was high and confidence levels were low. And I could see the clicks, just clear as day. It was like athletes, gamers, smart people, pretty people. They were all together. And I was anxious. Like, it made me nervous. And I sat down at one of the tables and started talking with some of the guys and some of the girls. And I looked at one of the girls and I said, is it hard to be here? Like, what is it like to be you here? And I'll never forget what she said. She looked me straight in the eye and she said, if you're not in, you're out, and you might as well be invisible. And I left that high school and my heart was just like, and all I could think of was, Lord, this can't be a reality that these students have to go to every day. It just broke me up. And I think the reason why it hurt so bad is because I was thrown straight back into high school for myself. And all I could think about was, yep, like, that's the game that's played. The game to be noticed, the game to be chosen, the game to be picked. And I know for myself, it was all about image. It was all about being perfect. There was this unbelievable pressure to be perfect. I don't know where it came from. I don't know who set it up. I don't know how it got there, but I played the game. So what does it look like? Be a part of the in crowd, check. Straight A's, be the valedictorian, check. Play volleyball, basketball, track, be a cheerleader, check, check, check. Date the most popular guy you can, check. Go to youth group, because that's what good girls do, check. And I noticed that it was so hard. It was, there was so much pressure. For my husband, same story. He's from Ohio, captain of the football team, check. Lift twice a day, check. Eat peanut butter, egg, blended grossness, check. Um, You know, date a pretty girl, be a leader in the party scene, check, check, check. But I just noticed for myself that I was so empty, and it was so empty. But more, more than that, I was tired. I was tired of trying to play the game, and it was wearing me out. And then it hit me one night. I was at my first Christian concert. I don't know, I love music. This whole band thing, I wish that I could sing. That would be amazing. Um, I, it was my first Christian concert ever. And I, I remember thinking, I had been to other concerts, and I remember going to this Christian concert, and I couldn't believe that I, there was no weed. I was like, I don't smell weed. Like, wow, this is awesome. And the bouncers were really friendly, and everyone was really nice, and they were like, excuse me, pardon me. I was like, what? And I remember being in the mosh pit, and I was down the front. It was, it was, the, the band was DC Talk. I don't know if you guys know. Do you guys know Toby Mac? Any Toby Mac fans? Okay, if you don't know Toby Mac, get to know Toby Mac. On the iPad. Running, love it. Okay. Um, DC Talk was the band. It was, a, it was phenomenal. But I was in the mosh pit, and I remember this guy, he was very tall. And you know, you love it when the very tall guys come and stand right in front of you in the mosh pit. And I remember he was walking towards me, and he had a shirt on, and it said, hey, you, on the front. And I remember, like, seeing it and go, and then he came and he stood right in front of me. And the back of his shirt says, hey, you, on the front. On the back it said, I'm into Jesus. So, hey, you, I'm into Jesus. And I remember the shows you where my faith was at the time. I thought, could he not find something else to wear? Like, how embarrassing. Like, who wears T-shirts that have Jesus on it? You know what I mean? Like, that's what I was thinking. I was, like, kind of felt bad for the guy. And the whole concert, he was right there. And this this T-shirt bothered me and I couldn't figure out why and for days it bothered me and then finally the question came clear as day I felt like the Lord said to me through that t-shirt Sarah are you afraid to be seen with me like 
are you afraid to be seen with me? And I'm telling you, that shirt broke me up because the answer was yes. And up until that time, I had sidelined God. God was, he was there, but he was at a distance. I kept my distance for so many reasons. I put him on the sideline. He was my ATM, genie in a bottle, teddy bear. And I knew he was there for me, but I had to keep a distance. And I think that question of, are you afraid to be seen with me? Yeah, because it didn't go with my checklist of my world's idea of perfect that I was trying so hard to keep up. But more than being afraid to be seen with him, I was afraid for him to see me. Because I just couldn't get him, I couldn't let him get that close. Because I was so broken and I was so empty and I was running so fast from all the things that I was scared of that I didn't want him to know where I was at. And so I kept my distance. And I would say to him, okay, God, here's, here's the deal. I am going to fix this. I'm going to clean that mess up. I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to get over that. I'm going to lose five pounds. And then I'm going to present myself to you, the perfect Sarah, and then you'll love me. Then you'll love me. And then you'll choose me because I got it all together. Because that's how it works in the world. You better have your trash together. And then you can come and maybe we'll love you. That's how I treated God. I had to prove myself. I know that we all struggle with this. I still to this day struggle with this. Does God love me or do I have to deserve it and prove it and be something for him to love me? And it was so loud. It was so strong in college that, or in high school that I just, I couldn't deal with it. It was too much. Little did I know that I couldn't have had this whole God thing more backwards or more screwed up. Do you guys remember the story in the Bible about Zacchaeus? You know, the dude in the tree? I remember when I was a kid, there was this song, and it was like this, about this Zacchaeus, the dude in the tree, and I never understood it. And I was like, why did God put that in the Bible? It makes no sense to me. And it wasn't until recently that I started reading that passage, and all of a sudden, it made so much sense. Zacchaeus is the guy, you know, Jesus is coming through Jericho, and there's crowds of people everywhere. And Zacchaeus, who, I might add, not the most popular guy in town. He was a short, rich tax collector who would overtax people and then spend that money himself. Not a stud, right? Not popular. Zacchaeus climbs a tree to be able to see Jesus. Jesus is walking through the crowd, you know, seeing everyone, and all these people are so excited for him to be there. And then all of a sudden, Jesus looks up, and he sees Zacchaeus in this tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, come out of the tree. I want to go to your house today. And everyone around says, is looking at Jesus and going, dude, pick anyone else. This guy's a loser. We do not want him to be representing. Okay, I don't know if they really said this, but I have a feeling this is what they said. We do not want him to be representing us like new. No. And Jesus looked at Zacchaeus and said, get out of the tree. I want to go with you. And the reason why is because the Lord, I mean, he knew Zacchaeus. He knew his past. He knew his fail, his failures, his everything that he was about. But he didn't just see that. He saw his future. He doesn't, our Lord doesn't just see where we're at. He sees where we're going. Amen. That's what, I, that's what I learned from that whole story of Zacchaeus was, oh my gosh, Jesus doesn't, he, he, didn't, he didn't come to Zacchaeus and say, okay, listen here, um, stay in the tree, don't move. I will be back in a year, and I need you to get your trash together, and then if you've kind of worked your way up, maybe I'll have dinner with you. That's not what God said. It's not how God even thinks about these things. That's how we think about it. And that's what I want you guys to do is try to figure out our Lord sees you. He notices you. He wants to be with you. There is no if-then clause with our Lord. It's not if you'll do this, if you'll do that, if you stop doing this, then maybe I'll love you. It's just not how it works. He wants you this weekend to bring everything that you're struggling with, everything, your list, everyone's list is different. He wants you to bring that entire list, and he wants you to lay it at his feet. You may, be have, you may have not gone to confession in a long time. You may have not been in a state where you even feel comfortable talking to people about what you're going through right now. You may be carrying things that are so heavy that you just don't think there's any way you can bring that out to the light, whether it's to God, 
whether it's to another person. But our Lord wants that so much from you, and that's that first step this weekend on that road to letting God see you and not being afraid to let him see you. He's dying to choose you. He's already chosen you. He's dying for you to recognize it. This weekend is about a battle. And I have to be honest with you guys. There is a battle waging for your heart and your mind, for your soul. You may know it's going on. You may not know it's going on. But I want you to fight with me this weekend. It looks something like this. The number one thing our Lord wants you to know and wants you to believe is that you're loved, that you're chosen, and that you're not alone, and he will never abandon you. That's what God wants you to believe. The number one thing the devil wants you to think, believe, and know is that God doesn't love you, you're too far far gone, your mistakes are way too big, and that you're alone and God has abandoned you. Look for the lie that little voice in your head that comes about every once in a while and says, what the heck are you doing here this weekend? Why are you here? You don't know anyone. You don't really belong here. That little voice in your head, ladies, it comes all the time. You're ugly, you're worthless, you're a failure. Guys, it comes to you all the time. You're never gonna amount to anything. He has what you, ha- what you want. Why are you even trying? Help me out, is that the voice of God? Everything that I've just told you about how chosen you are, how loved you are, how much he wants to be with you, calling you out of the tree and saying, get down here and be with me. If it's not the voice of God, then it probably is the voice of someone else. And you have to go to battle. When I was in high school, I chose to not believe in the devil because it freaked me out. And he took over and he had a foothold in my life because I didn't acknowledge him. But when I started seeing that Wow, it's, just not, it's not just me not fighting hard enough. There's actually an enemy, and I actually can fight back. The whole game changed. And I started to see that, okay, no, no, you're not going to mess with me. Like, that's a lie. I know the truth. And I have, in my own life, I have to work on this. So stuff will creep in, and I'll go, hmm, that's a lie. I know the truth. I want you guys to look for the lie this weekend. When, when, those voice, when that little voice creeps in and says stuff, Check it. Check it at the door and say, "Ah, I think that's a lie. I think I prefer the voice of God. And check it at the door. God wants to draw you closer to himself this weekend. I don't want there to be any more distance between you and God. Don't sideline God. Don't allow God to just sit on the sidelines and cheer you on. Bring him into the very center of your core of your being starting this weekend because that's where he wants to be. I told a friend of mine in college, I said, I wanna do big things for God. And he looked at me and he said, Sarah, when are you gonna let God do big things for you? It's not about making the team. You are on the team. God chose you. Accept it and run with the team. Be with us, be with the team. Don't believe the lies. Look for the lies, call them out, and be with our Lord this weekend.